Well, good Tuesday morning to you. Uh, thanks for joining in our, uh, our Upper Room Discourse Study. We're in week number four of it. We took last week off, as you'll recall, as we talked about um, the restart of our church services and what that would entail. So uh, uh, I want to pick it up where we left off in John chapter 14, I'll be reading just verses 15 through 18 today. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Two of the three major themes, or two major themes in, in this little passage, have to do one with loving one another, and secondly, have to do with the Holy Spirit. So let's just look at those two very briefly um, for, for a moment. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father. And hit the, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he's saying here, okay? There's several uh, other places in the Upper Room Discourse where he says that. One time he's already said it back in um, John 13, 34. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. So uh, he's saying this is a new commandment. By that, what he's saying is uh, you can't accomplish all that old law stuff in yourself. I'm giving you a new commandment. Really, the new commandment encompasses all the other commandments. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. And then chapter 15, later than what this passage we're reading today, says this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And in that passage it says that your joy may be full then you need to love one another. In other words, you can't be joyful without loving one another. We are not a we are not commanded to agree with each other. We are commanded to love each other. And Jesus is telling them this just before they go through a crisis because in a crisis you need that. You need to uh, you need to function in that love. We've seen that in our current crisis that that it lends itself to arguments and hurt feelings and those sorts of things and divisiveness that are un unnecessary. We should be loving each other through it, even if we disagree. And uh, uh, love is what we're commanded to do. You know, Jesus had a pretty diverse group. I don't know if you've thought about that or not, but in his group of disciples, he had a guy called Simon the Zealot. And he also had a guy named Matthew. Now, consider those two guys for just a second. They are polar opposites politically. The Zealots were a group of people in uh, Israel at that time who advocated for uh, armed rebellion against the Romans. They assassinated Romans and Roman collaborators, uh, people who... Uh, worked for the Roman government, were subject to be killed by zealots who operated at night, and the Roman government uh, came out against them real strong, uh, hunting them down and, and all of that. So it was, a, it was a, an armed struggle with the zealots. So Simon the Zealot is one of his disciples, and Matthew was a tax collector who worked with the Roman government to collect taxes from his own people, a very hated group but is the, the whole other end of the spectrum from Simon the Zealot. He's a cooperator. He's a collaborator. He made his living off the Roman government, yet Jesus called both of them, and he calls us from different places, and uh, uh, he did call them to rise above those petty differences to a kingdom functioning that is different, and to do that, it was required that they love one another. If they loved one another, they could look past some of those differences. I suspect there were some pretty uh, diverse uh, viewpoints even among the other guys too, but we know uh, in those two guys that there, there would be. And the second theme that he talks about in here is the helper that he's going to send. And I will pray the Father and he'll give you another helper, that Holy Spirit who you know because he's been with you, but he will be in you. Now, we're going to deal with the Holy Spirit in a couple of weeks and maybe in a little more detail when he gets into uh, more uh, discussion with them. But right here, he's just saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to send you a helper that's going to help you do this stuff I'm asking you to do, like love one another and like endure this crisis that you're about to go through because they're, nah, they're going to kill me. Uh, so you're going you're gonna to need the Holy Spirit, uh, but he's, he's going to be with you. You know him but he's going to be in you. And that's a reference to what happens after Jesus' resurrection in John chapter 20, uh, verses 19 through 22 says this, Then the same day at evening, this is his resurrection day, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace 
be with you. Peace is another major theme in, in uh, the upper room discourse. It, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So it was at that time. See, salvation as we know it wasn't available to them until after the resurrection, after he had paid for their sins and taken them on himself and, and then defeated Satan in hell and risen again and gone to heaven and presented his blood on the mercy seat there. Until that happened, salvation as we know it couldn't occur and the indwelling residence of the Holy Spirit couldn't couldn't happen but here he's come back he's just coming back after having uh, uh, ascended into heaven and, and presenting his blood there he, now he's come back to his disciples as he promised that he would return he said uh, uh, now receive the Holy Spirit and so so it is that we get that at salvation he dwells in us now there's a further uh, anointing a baptism in the Holy Spirit there are fillings there are other things but prior to his resurrection, there was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, immediately after that, in John 20, he tells them, receive the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 2, he's going to get into being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's a whole other discussion for another day. Uh, but what he's saying here is, love one another. You're going to need to do that. You need each other's love during this time. And I'll send you a helper to help you do that. Uh, to keep my commandment, which is to love one another, uh, you're gonna need you're gonna need his help. And then he says, uh, "I won't leave you as orphans." The Father's gonna send this spirit. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now there are two possible interpretations of that. Maybe he's just saying, "I'm gonna come back after the resurrection." But I think what fits the context better is, "I'm coming in the form of the Holy Spirit," which is to say, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. It is. They are one. They are the same person. Uh, well, they're separate persons, but they're the same God. They're the same in essence. And so he's coming to us in the form of the Holy Spirit uh, once we know him. Uh, we'll pick up the, the lesson there again next week. Thanks for joining me. I hope you'll have a great week. God bless you.